So my name is Megan O'Connell and I am an assistant level professor in the Department of Psychology and I teach in the clinical psychology program and my research and my clinical work is very applied and involves a lot of community outreach. So I'd like to detail two uh, predominant areas that I do. One is I work as a clinical psychologist at the Rural and Remote Memory Clinic, which is a unique clinic in that it's an interdisciplinary clinic. There is a neurologist, Dr. Andrew Kirk, who's the head of the Division of Neurology. There's myself. I have specialty training in clinical neuropsychology. We also have physical therapy team and we make use of all of these different expertises. We make use of telehealth video conferencing as much as we can. We get blood work requisitions ahead of time before we have patients come in and we have um, a time with the CT um, head scan in the afternoons and we get people from rural Saskatchewan who have concerns about memory changes as they age to come to our clinic. They just come in for one day. They see all these specialists at one day, in one day and by the end of the day we can rule out things like a stroke or a tumor that might be causing the changes or uh, metabolic changes due to blood work that could be causing the cognitive changes and I get to uh, detail their cognitive abilities and by the end of the day we have a pretty good sense of whether or not this may be uh, dementia or not. And that's uh, one of my clinics and I train practicum students, so clinical psychology practicum students in that and that's quite a rewarding experience. It's, it's a very busy day. We do collect some research data from it but really the evaluation project started before I came on faculty here in July 2008. And the evaluation was whether or not this type of a one-stop model for a clinic could work. And that evaluation project's been done, and yes, it does work. Um, so that's one area, but as I said, that main evaluation's been done. Really what I want to talk about is my new area of research, which is where I'm spending probably the next multiple years, um, which is making use of telehealth video conferencing to provide services to rural um, caregivers of persons diagnosed with atypical dementias. So I'll probably step back and talk about dementia as a construct, since I assume everyone knows what I'm talking about. Um, dementia is really just a collection of terms to define somebody who can no longer function in their daily life. It's a decline from previous functioning, and they have multiple areas of cognitive impairment. And the most common type of dementia is Alzheimer's disease, which is, um, tends to be of a later onset. There's early onset ones, but they're, they're pretty rare. So they tend to be of a later onset. And there are a lot of supports for caregivers of persons with Alzheimer's disease across the province. In fact, um, aptly named the Alzheimer's Society of Saskatchewan does pretty fantastic work and does a lot of support groups for uh, caregivers and for persons who have dementia due to Alzheimer's. One of the things that, as a clinical psychologist, we've been discovering is our spouses or families struggling with atypical dementias, which um, I'm defining as ones that are typically early onset, so um, the type of dementia I'll describe now is called um, frontotemporal dementia or frontotemporal degeneration. And its mean age of onset is 52. So it's a quite a different mean age of onset than say the Alzheimer disease, which is, which is well passed into the 70s. So there are atypical dementias in terms of their age of onset, but they're also atypical in terms of the cognitive and behavioral changes that are early on. So the behavioral variant of frontotemporal degeneration is characterized by personality changes. So somebody who was previously a very outgoing, sociable person may become quite withdrawn. So that's one, and then typically they get diagnosed with depression, and then it's clear that that's not just, but it is. So they come see someone like me. Or <coughs> somebody who previously was, um, a fairly upstanding citizen all of a sudden starts pathological gambling or behaving in a manner that could be sexually inappropriate or um, probably substance using, for instance, or things that are quite out of character for them. And the differential for that is, of course, a, a, a bipolar. You can have a bipolar onset, well, in your 50s. It's not unheard of. It's not even considered late onset bipolar. And the different, but really what happens, we frequently get those referrals from psychiatrists who followed people <coughs> who have these kind of behavior changes and it's clear that they've got cognitive changes in addition to these behavior changes and they're getting worse over time. Whereas someone with bipolar, you stabilize them, you give them medications, they get better over time. So um, 
as you can imagine, having a spouse whose behaviors have changed that dramatically, um, essentially their personality changes, that can be very challenging. So we've, um, I've seen quite a few families struggling with this in the clinic, and they're finding that they don't connect all that well with, first of all, um, caregivers of people who are maybe 20 years older than them. And um, so they, you know, as I said, the mean age of onset of the frontal temporal degenerations in the 50s, mean age of onset of Alzheimer's disease in the 70s. So there's a different life course. I mean, if you're in your 50s, you're still working. It's not unheard of for us to hear of families where the person who has this difficulty actually stopped working likely due to the difficulty but wasn't given disability because nobody really knew that this was a problem. They retired early. So they have um, very different financial challenges as well. Um, but also the very different cognitive, and this is where the neuropsychologist in me comes in, very different cognitive presentations. A personality change or a language change is very different from what's characteristic in early stage Alzheimer's disease, which is memory. <coughs> so we um, essentially decided with our clinical work that this population wasn't being well serviced by the Alzheimer's Society of Society, um, Saskatchewan. So back in, I think it was March of 2009, about six months after I started here, I started on a telehealth support group. And the reason we use telehealth is first, these atypical dementias are fairly rare, they're not very common. And um, thus the name atypical, <laughs> I use to describe them. Um, and because we're, we were working with people in rural Saskatchewan, they live kind of spattered across the province. So I think we had initially maybe seven or eight families across the province who were dealing with these similar challenges. Well, they can't all travel into Saskatoon. Some of them, it's eight or nine hour drive. So they can't all travel in Saskatoon to get help in a support group format. But me talking to them isn't as helpful as them getting to talk to each other because nobody really gets what's going on other than the people who are also dealing with the same challenges. So we decided we, um, the clinic had been making good use of telehealth video conferencing for our pre-clinic assessments and for follow-up for quite a few years. So we thought, well, why can't we use this for an intervention, a psychological intervention for a support group? And we began the first, at that time, it was the first support group um, done by telehealth video conferencing for persons with atypical dementia. In fact, telehealth interventions at that time were still pretty new in the literature, and it wasn't until a f about a year later that some of the first research came out suggesting telehealth was quite useful and um, fairly close to in-person for group interventions. So we started that, as I said, in 2009. It worked quite well. We did some research evaluation on it, and my paper on that's finally coming out um, while well, it's online in press now. Um, but one of the things that came out of our evaluation project was our caregiver said, this works, duh, why are you asking us? Really what we need to do is help more people like us. Um, and they pushed for the Alzheimer's Society to recognize that they weren't providing the same supports to people who had atypical and early onset forms of dementia. And their advocacy led to what's my new exciting project, I can't take any claim for their advocacy. They, they pulled me along kicking and screaming. Um, and now I'm working with the Alzheimer's Society. So I have been running a support group with the Alzheimer's Society for the past year and training the uh, program services manager of the province, John Michael, working with her. She's training me, I'm training her. I think that's what we've discovered. It's probably more working out to be. And we run a support group for um, people across the province who have a challenges with atypical dementias. And now more recently, I have a new faculty, a new staff member with the Alzheimer's Society coming on board with my original support group. And I'm now beginning to evaluate that project. And it's a less evaluation of the support group and how it's received by those who are in it, but more an evaluation of how a staff member who is in the community and works in a community service, who's typically does support groups in person, how it feels, first of all, to be working with an academic. One of the things we discovered is despite my very applied work, I still have different language than these community-based service providers. It's quite interesting. Um, but two, how it um, is like to learn how to do an intervention via telehealth video conferencing, which is still quite novel. And three, what it's like to be learning about an atypical dementia, which not many um, 
individuals would be as comfortable working with. So that's my evaluation project. Okay. So uh, yeah, <laughs> the other things I should talk about um, is with because of my work with this video conferencing um, intervention, I worked with another colleague in psychology, uh, Jordan Cummings, and we got a Canadian Foundation for Innovation grant to build the VITAL, what we call the VITAL, and it stands for the Video Therapy Analysis Lab. And it's part of the uh, social sciences research lab laboratories, which are unique across Canada in, the, in their interconnectedness. And they think the, um, there are many future projects planned for my work in the VITAL, but I think what I'd like to do is briefly detail the one that's likely going to be starting its data collecting next year. And as I mentioned previously, I, I work with rural dementia care. So one of our goals in this overarching program of research is to provide services to people who live in rural Saskatchewan who cannot travel into the city to see a specialist. So my um, most senior PhD student, Rachel Burton, her dissertation is looking at um, providing cognitive rehabilitation, which is essentially sometimes strategies, sometimes practicing strategies, and sometimes working with a caregiver to help people who have early stage Alzheimer's, uh, dementia due to Alzheimer's disease. And she's going to be comparing whether or not we can do some of these um, cognitive rehabilitation strategies over telehealth and compare that to in-person. So the nice thing about the lab is she's the set up that she, so she can do half of her sessions in person, half in the lab and, and counterbalance those sessions. So we'll be looking at whether or not, first of all, is it even feasible to do cognitive rehabilitation by telehealth? It's never been done. And secondly, is there any evidence to suggest um, there's comparability to in-person? So that's her work that's going to be done with the SSRL labs. <laughs> yeah. 